Welcome, Rotarians and guests. I just woke up our speaker here. We should have given him a heads up. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I know you'd much rather be someplace where it's warm and sunny, but because you're in Toledo, we appreciate you joining us today. Today, we're going to hear from Steve Bailey from the National Management Association. But before we get to that, I'm going to invite Father O for a reflection. And then Will Lewis, a new member, will lead us in the pledge. It is said that when Solomon became king of Israel after his father David, God said to him, ask whatever you will. And it's said that Solomon asked for wisdom so he could lead his people wisely. Today our programs on leadership, and all of us here are leaders in one respect or another, and so we pray Solomon's prayer for wisdom. O oh God, who have made all things by your word, and by your wisdom have formed humankind to have dominion over the creatures you have made and rule the world in holiness and righteousness. Give me wisdom that sits by your throne. I am your servant, the son of your serving girl, a man who is weak and short-lived. Even one who is perfect among human beings will be regarded as nothing without the wisdom that comes from you. With you is wisdom. She knows your works and was present when you made the world. She understands what is pleasing in your sight and what is right according to your commandments. Send her forth from the holy heavens and from the throne of your glory send her, that I may learn what is pleasing to you for she knows and understands all things, and she will guard me wisely in my actions. Then my works will be acceptable, and I shall judge your people justly. To our prayer we say, Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible and Thank you, Father Owen Will. Thanks to our March sponsors, Nancy and Tom Cabot with Wells Bowen. We have no visiting Rotarians today. A reminder that we do have a guest table, and we ask that you stop by and say hello to our guests that are seated at the guest table. And at this time, if you have a guest to introduce to us, please bring them to the microphone. President Sharon, I have with me Casey Hoke uh, from the YMCA. Uh, he will be replacing uh, Brad Toth, who moved to Waterville, unfortunately. But Casey will be with us from now on. New member. Casey, welcome. Okay, no other guests today? This is a great time to check in on social media, let people know that you are attending the Rotary Club of Toledo's Monday meeting. So once you've checked in, liked Rotary, I invite you to check out and give yourself the gift of Rotary for an hour. And please silence your cell phones. Just a real quick polio update. There have only been three new cases since the first of the year, and that happened between January 1 and January 6. So I'm happy to report that truly, folks, we are this close. So we'll keep up our efforts in that area. Sometimes people ask me what Rotary is. Rotary is where friends, neighbors, and problem solvers share ideas, join leaders, and take action for lasting change. Creating change in our community is why we have our signature event, ITSA. This year, it's a cabaret. At this time, I'm going to invite co-chair Scott Hinshaw up to share some information on It's a Cabaret. Good afternoon, Rotarians. Uh, in case you haven't heard, uh, April 13th is the date for our It's a Cabaret. I will certainly be there, and I'm looking forward to all the fun. 
And we have a uh, short clip to show you of some of the fun we've had in years past. So, well. Now get ready to move your feet, cause Rotary rocks! See, you, uh, you can't miss this one. So. so invite your friends, invite your colleagues. Don't forget to buy your raffle tickets, and I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you, Scott. Is Tommy Romer here today? Tommy? I was going to ask what he was hiding behind those tails, because he was the only one in tails, so I'm not sure what he was trying to hide there. But we can't promise you a reprise, but we can promise you a lot of fun, so please put it on your calendar. Um, this time I'm going to invite our, uh, one of our recipients of the Paul Harris Fellowship, Brian Kennedy, to now award a Paul Harris Fellowship to Rob Crane. Brian and Rob. Fellow Rotarians, it gives me great pleasure today to present a Paul Harris Fellow to Rob Crane. Rotarians, as you know, we can, address, we can designate a Paul Harris Fellow to recognize a person whose life demonstrates a shared purpose with the objectives and mission of Rotary International. Rob's leadership in volunteering in Rotary, as well as beyond, demonstrates the shared purpose and objectives of Rotary International. I first met Rob in 2012 when I joined the Black Swamp Conservancy as the board treasurer. Uh, the following year, when Rob became the executive director of Black Swamp, the entity had 13,000 acres of protected land in northwest Ohio. Today, under Rob's leadership, Black Swamp now has nearly 18,000 acres of protected land. On a, April 21st, Earth Day weekend, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Rob and the Black Swamp Conservancy, in partnership with our club and four other Rotary, Rotary clubs in this area, we have an opportunity to tour one of these protected properties as well as help plant a native tree as part of Rotary International's challenge to plant one tree for every Rotarian. I've enjoyed my service on the board as Black Swamp Conservancy, and I'd like to, rock, like to thank Rob for his service. Fellow Rotarians and guests, please join me in congratulating and recognizing Rob Crane. Paul Harris Fellowship, as you know, is one of the highest honors that can be given to any Rotarian, so congratulations, Rob. At this time, I'm going to invite George Eistetter to come up. George, a member since 1975, and he is going to introduce new member Lou Rosenblum from uh, Toledo Country Club. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing well today. Fellow Rotarians, <clears throat> I am pleased to introduce our newest member, Lou Rosenblum to you. Past president and longtime member Walt Churchill joins me in his sponsorship. Lou joined the Toledo Country Club as COO and general manager in March of last year. 
Lou has spent most of his life in the Cincinnati area, having studied photojournalism at Kent State University before graduating from the University of Cincinnati. He first used that education by working for a newspaper in Middletown, Ohio, before being in the photographic equipment and supply business for five years. Boy, that's a long word. <laughs> he began his career in country club management after meeting his future wife-to-be, Connie, who was already working for a club in the Cincinnati area and encouraged him in this endeavor. Before coming to Toledo, Lou was involved with two clubs in the Cincinnati area and one in North Carolina. He has long been involved with the Club Managers Association of America. He, he, Lou and his wife have a grown daughter and family and two granddaughters. They recently purchased a home in suburban Maumee. His pet peeve is, hmm, this is a real new one. I don't think I've heard this one before. Potholes. <laughs> Please welcome Lou Rosenblum to one of the largest of 32,000 Rotary Clubs in the world. Thank you. Thank you, George, for sharing the gift of Rotary with Lou. George, a longtime great member of the club. We have a couple of floor mic announcements. Rachel Hobson from Vocational Services, followed by Aubrey Hornsby from New Members. Good afternoon, Rotarians. Nice to see everyone today. Um, so next week is the first Interact interview event that we're going to have for this Rotary year, and we're going to have the Young Men of Excellence from Waite High School. Thank you to Gary Corgan, who's uh, coordinated that. We need at least six more volunteers for that event. These interviews really are designed for these students to interview you about your professional life. And of course, our greatest goal is to help uh, give the message of how we implement the four-way test in our professional lives as well as our personal lives as appropriate to the conversation, of course. And then we have two more events. St. Francis is coming on uh, March 26th, and then Toledo School for the Arts on April 23rd. So if you are interested in signing up, please refer to the spoke. There's online uh, a, a button that you can click on in the box that describes the interviews, and you can sign up online there. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much. Rachel, before you go, how many students will we be serving between all of the interviews? Just this year? Just this year. This year, you know, ideally it will probably be around 50, which will put us at about 140 since the project started, which is very exciting because even one of these students to have this time, you know, that's what they were looking for is the time with the Rotarians to talk one-to-one. -one. So it's a big success. Thank you to our Vocational Services Committee. <laughs> Aubrey. Hello. Hi, oh, yeah, we're doing our uh, annual, well, our third under 40s event at the 10 Can on March 21st. That is next Wednesday. The 10 Can, if you haven't been there, is on Erie and Huron Street in the Berdan building. It looks like it's closed, but I assure you it's open and it's a lot of fun. Um, if you're an employer here, please tell all your under 40 employees to come to this event. Uh, if you are under 40 and you're here today, make sure you invite friends that can attend. It should be a lot of fun. It's a great opportunity to show everyone what the Rotary is all about. And I think at least three people from our last event at uh, the Toledo Spirits joined, and they're sitting at that table over there. So ask them um, why they joined, and, uh, and like I said before, please invite as many uh, under 40 people as you can to the Tin Can next Wednesday, March 21st. So, Aubrey, how about us that are over 40? Are we invited? You are not. No, I'm a, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll uh, allow a few. Check with me first. We'll Thank see what you. the uh, attendance will be. But no. All right. So anybody <laughs> over 40, please make reservations with Aubrey. And I suggest you call him about midnight to make those reservations. Yeah. That'd Thank be great. you. Look forward to it. Thank you to the new member committee. They're doing a great job.
And one of our younger members who needs not much in the way of introductions, Travis Tangeman, is going to introduce our speaker today, Steve Bailey. Travis. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, if I can get my papers to hold still, I guess I'll hold them. Um, so when asked for a short bio, this is what our speaker today provided. Steve Bailey was born and raised in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and received his undergraduate degree and a master's in public administration from West Virginia University. Employed in the banking profession prior to joining NMA, Steve initially served as regional manager for NMA's 12-state Northeast area. He eventually moved to Dayton, Ohio, and joined the NMA headquarters staff serving in a variety of positions. Steve became president and executive director on January 1, 1993. He also serves as a member of the Board of Regents of the Institute of Certified Professional Managers, located on the campus of James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. In his spare time, Steve is active with the Sigma Chi International Fraternity. He is a member of the Risk Management Faculty, where he does leadership training for undergraduate students. That's where Steve left off. What Steve won't tell you is that he is just a bit more than that. You see, I met Steve through Sigma Chi, and he is much more than that. Since Sigma Chi's founding, and I know there's some fellow SIGs here in the room, a little over 300,000 men have been initiated into our ranks. Steve, being ever so modest, will never tell you that of those more than 300,000 people, he is one of the 0.23% of all Sigma Chi's to have ever been inducted into the Order of Constantine which is the highest honor a Sigma Chi can receive. But that's not what makes Steve special. Let me give you a little context. See, having known Steve for over 25 years, like me or not, Steve is a huge reason for who I am today. Outside of my parents, this man was the first person in my life that ever challenged me to ask what it was that I wanted not only to be, but to give to the world. This man changed how I viewed the world a world where I wasn't the deserved recipient, but a world that would benefit beyond myself. The day I met Steve was a September day in 1992. I was a shy kid who was trying to figure out where he belonged and found himself at a fraternity rush event. Expecting, expecting the same spiel about how a group partied or how they were popular, I was seated in a room eating spaghetti and wondering why the hell I was awake this early, and a man came to a podium. My life was changed at that moment. I won't bore you with the details of what he said, but for the first time in my life, I wanted something, and it was something very similar to Rotary. I won't lie, I was excited for what it did for me, but I was more excited about what it could do for the world. And this is why this man became not only my first mentor, but he became my best friend. Since that day, we have done dozens of speeches together, but I always go first. That way, I get to relive my 19-year-old self and get to watch him close the show. So it is with great honor that I get to present Steve Bailey, President and Executive Director of the National Management Association, and one of the greatest friends I'll ever have the honor of knowing. Travis majored in creative writing in college, by the way. He made all of that up. <laughs> Thank you, Travis, that was pretty nice. Uh, and I appreciate it. Lou, welcome. Nice to have you uh, joining the organization. Hopefully after I'm done, you'll want to come back for another luncheon. Uh, we'll try not to um, uh, stand in the way. And a special shout out to my new best friend, Wally. When I found out uh, I was coming to speak, I get a 124 page email from Wally <laughs> with details as to how to do this. The only thing he didn't cover was what will happen to me if I screw up. <laughs> so I stand here, delighted to be here, but with somewhat bated breath, not sure what will happen, and whether the big hook will come from up above or behind. So at any rate, uh, it is wonderful to be here. There is a brochure at your desk, at your, at your table. And uh, Wally, I'm going to go ahead and get the slides moving here, if it's okay with you. Anyway, that will tell you. Uh, all right, let's go back one. Let's go there. All right, that will tell you a little bit. I'm going to give you my 
Um, 45 second elevator speech. I do work for a professional educational society known as NMA, the Leadership Development Organization. We've been around since 1925. I wasn't working there yet. Um, but we were started as the Dayton Foreman's Club and then grew into the National Association of Foremen. About 1956, the name was changed because the mission had changed to the National Management Association. And then about 2005, we rebranded into NMA, kind of like AT&T. They didn't lose their name. They just started going by their initials. NMA, the Leadership Development Organization, because that's, that's where we are and what we're doing. I, have ch I was chatting with Katie outside a little bit, and uh, I told her, I said, we have chapters as large as 2200 at Lockheed Martin in Fort Worth, where they build uh, the F-35s to uh, just up the road in Detroit. I have one at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. They're at about 1,100 members. And, but most of our chapters are small in the 50 to 100 range, just in-house organizations, some community-based, where people come together on a regular basis to learn from one another. <clears throat> they hold monthly luncheons, much like this. They do professional development classes, sometimes at lunch, as lunch and learns, other times as after hours programs. They're out in the community doing community service, but they are run by the employees who belong to them. So it's, it's kind of like Rotary in many, many ways in that um, we're just asking professional men and women to get together and say, what do we need to grow personally and professionally. So I have um, seen a lot in my tenure with NMA. I was back in my college town of Morgantown in November, and I ran in to my first boss and my first mentor. And once we decided that we were both lucky that we still had hair, albeit white, um, I said to him, and I said, I don't mind the white hair because I appreciate the wisdom that comes with it. And without missing a beat, Barton looked at me and he goes, it's not wisdom, it's perspective. And I went, oh. He said, wisdom comes later. I don't know how much later, but obviously I don't have it. <laughs> so I am here to basically give some lessons learned and some best practices from what I've observed over the, my many years working with such a broad range of business and industry. And maybe another way to put it, I love those farmers insurance commercials where they say, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. So that's kind of where I'm coming from today. So um, let's get started with one of the things we do every year in our organization is honor an executive of the year. It could be from a small organization, it could be from a large one. In this case, this is Hudson Drake, who had a background in aerospace and uh, military, uh, running many, many different companies. He was at Teledyne at the time he was executive of the year. And I always, I never had legitimate thought of my own. I steal them from other people. And I always have a card in my pocket so I can write down something that someone might say. Well, that night I was busy writing. Because one of the things he said looking out over the audience, he goes, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if leaders are born or if they're made. But what I do know is that you always see them coming. And then he kind of tossed out a question. He goes, so who are these people? And But he answered his own question during his acceptance remarks. He said, they are people who add value. Their contributions are visible. And then he added, and they are people who have impact. Their contributions make a difference. So that's really what I want to talk about. I understand I have until three. Is that right, Sharon? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> um, that's really what I want to talk about is how much impact are you having? So let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, you don't have to be a CEO, and you don't have to sit in a corner office to have impact. All of us, every single day, have an opportunity to positively influence other people, and ultimately the performance of whatever team we're on, whether it's Rotary, whether it's back at Owings Coining, whether it's uh, at the car dealership, your insur insurance agency, it doesn't matter. Because you see, leadership is not about the position you hold in an organization. That's a huge mistake a lot of people make. 
Leadership is a matter of the influence you have on others. And in my career, one of the wisest people and one of the best leaders I've ever known was a maintenance man in our office for many years. Joe was just wise beyond his years. And he always had something positive to say, and he always had a unique way of looking at things. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I'm not a leader and I'm not a manager, to which I went, oh, yes, you are. Everybody can lead, and everybody's a manager. You manage your time, you manage your desks, you manage your projects. Some days you just manage to get to work. So we're all managing in one way, shape, or form. So let's move on and let's talk about five ways where you have impact. One of the reasons I always put a number to things is that when I get to number five, Lou and everybody else can go, thank God he's almost done. So we're working there. All right. Um, in terms of knowledge and skills and abilities, what you have to recognize is no one brings to the table the same background, knowledge, education, experience that you bring. So your perspective is unique, and it's valuable, and you have to know how to use it to your advantage. But it's more than just technical know-how. You know, for most of us, uh, we enter the workforce with a basic set of skills, maybe with a degree or an interest or some kind of internship. But there aren't very many people in this room this afternoon that are still doing what you did when you first entered the workplace, myself included. Because career tracks have a funny way of changing. And Travis knows back at the University of Dayton, I used to tell all the guys, especially the liberal arts majors, take a course in accounting. And they'd look at me like, why? And I said, because I don't care where you start. At some point in time, somebody's going to throw a balance sheet in front of you. And you're going to look at that and you're going to go, uh-oh. Um, maybe I got a degree and not an education. So these career tracks change. So what happens to us? Our roles change. Suddenly we assume management responsibilities. And somewhere along the line we figure out we need to fine tune some other skills. So arguably, <coughs> excuse me, the most important of those are communication skills. I'm not talking about reading and writing or even public speaking necessarily, although they all help. Um, to me, a lot of it is about learning to read other people and answer your phone and turning your phone off when it's ringing in the middle of the day. Um, that's okay. You just go ahead and take that call. <laughs> if it's my mom, tell her I'll be home later. So uh, being understanding communication. I mean, let's think about it. How many times have you sat in a meeting and you've watched someone shoot themselves in the foot and they don't even know they're bleeding? You're sitting there going, oh my God, I can't believe they said that or they did that. A high impact manager pays attention to how he or she is perceived. You also know that listening and hearing aren't the same thing. So, Peter Drucker, um, who was still writing books at the ripe old age of about 112, I think. Peter, this is one of my favorite quotes. Let's see if we can get it up here. Wally, are you with the program? Uh, okay, well, anyway, um, back one. Okay, there we go. What Peter Drucker said at one point in time was, most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said. And to me, this is not a throwaway line. It's kind of easy to sit out in the audience and go, okay, cool line, cool quote. Um, and we're going to talk about change in a minute, but most organizations are awash in change. So if you want to have impact, then you've got to pay attention to how the people around you are dealing with it. They're going to ask you some questions, and they're going to show some concern. But chances are, it's like that old iceberg. It's what's below the surface that can come back and bite you. And this is why I'm a huge promote, proponent of managing by walking around. 
You have got to get out of the office. You have got to know what's going on with your people. I don't care if you talk to them in the water cooler, in the kitchen, in the parking lot. It doesn't make any difference. you got to find out. That's how you have impact. So another skill, political skills. Kind of joined at the hip with communication skills in some ways. But to me, it's simple. It's acquiring knowledge of the organization in which you work. How does it work? How do people function in it? And I'm here this, this afternoon to tell you that having a political sense is not the same thing as playing politics. One is having a sense of timing, setting the stage for success, getting things done. The other is self-serving and backbiting and usually backfires. And none of us really mind when someone who's playing politics gets caught and nailed. To me, it's having impact by understanding the power structure. And it's understanding that org, org charts are done in eight and a half by 11 for a very simple reason, so you can file them away. Many times in most organizations, power is vested somewhere else on that org chart. And if you're gonna have impact, you spend enough time, you do enough digging to find out who really holds the power. Having a political sense means you can get to the action center through the action chain of an organization, all the people who get things done, and yet you don't cut out the wrong people or step over somebody along the way. And making it come across naturally and positively is how you have impact. And a phrase, a couple of phrases that I love to use here, Travis heard him when he was an undergraduate, so here we go, 25 years later, still saying it. If you're going to have impact, you have to know how to influence without inflaming. You have to know how to coerce people, not dictate. You have to know how to disagree without being disagreeable. Saturday afternoon, I was on a phone call from work. A whole bunch of my Lockheed Martin chapters were convening. They were coming in from California, Texas. They were meeting in Greenville, South Carolina. And they had just a kind of status of the organization meeting. And even on the phone, supposed to be an hour, it was two. Even on the phone, I could tell that one gentleman was just irritating the living, you know what, out of everybody else. And he was clueless. And I would love to bid him out in the room when that meeting was over. All right, uh, another way you have impact, your personal qualities and your ability to use them. First of all, you have to know how to make a decision. You go, okay, fair enough. But then you have to be willing to make it. So many people hem and haw and will not buckle down. You know, they keep seeking more data. They keep wanting more information, more input. All well and good, but at some point in time, you have to stop it. And you have to decide what you're going to do. A high-impact manager also recognizes that someday you're a baggage handler. I remember when I was young, I remember my dad or he hearing people say, don't take your personal problems to work. Good advice. But do you really know anybody who follows that? No. Now, we've got all kinds of different people. There are some folks who have personal issues. They're in the car. They're outside in the parking lot, and they're there, but you really don't see them. And then you have other people on your team who they bring their issues inside and they're sitting in the briefcase right by the desk, ready to surface at any time. And then there's always the individual who brings his or her problems to work, throws it open on the desk, opens it up, unzips it, and invites you in to see everything that's going on in their life. And you and I just have to deal with that. Times have changed. If we are leading an organization, you're going to have all of these people. So you have to know when to be a coach, when to be a counselor, and when to be a mentor. And you have to be sharp enough to know the difference between those. And you might be sitting out there going, oh, God, here he goes. I do not have time for all this personal stuff and people issues. I would suggest to you that you better because it's the people who work with you who get the job done for you. So the other thing you got to do, you got to have a sensitivity to people, and you got to have a sense of perspective. One of my favorite lines that I stole from a magazine article years ago said that some managers are like the bottom half of a double boiler. 
They get all steamed up, but they don't really know what's cooking. And for the under 40 crowd, this is the double boiler. These are three of them. <laughs> I figured you, I'd save you from being really rude in front of me and grabbing your phones and Googling it. So here's the picture. Well, there was the picture. Getting bent out of shape. You know, I don't think I ever got bent out of shape in my, in my life, and I don't do it very often, actually. But I don't think I've ever done it that I didn't end up regretting it because I didn't have all the information. I saw what was on the surface. I didn't know what was going on. All right, moving on. I read a great article not too long ago. It said, people have an enormous capacity to endure boredom if they identify personally with the purpose of the seemingly boring job. And you're probably going, well, why is he sharing this? Because in your workplace, as mine, there are people who are tasked with the daily routines of just keeping the ship afloat. They may be making widgets. They may be filing. They may be answering the phone. They may be at the call center. To which I've adopted that phrase, and I call it Steve's mailbox theory. Now, how many of you like to mow the yard? Raise your hand. Oh, you need some mental health counseling. <laughs> I've never understood why when it's 95 degrees, and I know probably, what, two days a year gets 95 in Toledo. When it's 95 and humid and it's gross and the, it's thick and you're outside and you're pushing a lawnmower back and forth, or maybe you've still got a riding lawnmower, maybe you've, you know, you've moved on up. But at some point in time, that's really miserable. But why do we do it? We do it because our name is on the mailbox. I mean, think about it. Someone new moves into the neighborhood, and I've just gone through this. I have uh, two families on either side of me that have moved in within the past two years. What do you do automatically when someone moves in? The first thing you judge people by is how well are they taking care of the yard? You do it. You're going to sit there and deny it, but you're lying. I know you do it. Well, that's what we have to do at work. We have to put people's names on the mailbox. We have to recognize them for what they do. You've got to go chat with them, and you need to let someone know. Maybe they're in a, not necessarily a dead-end job, but they're not going to progress, and they know it, and you know it, and they're going to be there for a long time. That's okay. They still are valuable. They still are critical. And your job is to get your you-know-what out of your chair, and walk around and let people see you and let people know that you appreciate what they do. Another quote is, every job is a self-portrait of the individual who performs it. So we've got to make sure we show that we appreciate their artwork. All right, here's a slide. And of course, you can't read it, and that's, by, that's deliberate, because this is all the theorists out there that want to tell you everything about leading and managing and how they're alike and how they're different and where they cross over and you can just become an HR person and study this till hell freezes over, at which point I'm going, useless. Here's what it is, in my estimation. It's very simple. Managing is keeping an organization on track and leading is laying new track. The secret is, we have to do both. No matter what you do, some days you're just keeping, as you used the phrase earlier, the ship afloat. Other days you're charting a new direction. You're trying to grow. You're trying to figure it out. And that's okay. The, reason, the only reason I'm even bothering is say, don't get stuck just managing. It's so easy to do that. It's so easy to get caught up in the minutia. But if you're going to have impact then you have to understand what's really going on and you have to be laying new track and be preparing for the future. All right, number three, you have impact through your attitudes about work. Many years ago, I was at one of our chapters at Dresser Clark in Olean, New York, small town in the uh, <clears throat> southwestern portion near the Pennsylvania border, blue collar industry, Still have had a management chapter when I started back when Ho Herbert Hoover was in the White House, and they still have one. And I remember that night, I was at the head table like this, and they had a speaker by the name of Dr. David Gordon from Cornell. 
And no offense to Dr. Gordon, but you could just tell there was no dirt under his fingernails and there never had been. So he's in this blue collar audience. He's looking out over the crowd and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, do you recognize that someone depended upon you today for inspiration? I'm sitting two seats over and I'm looking out over the crowd and I'm going, they are not buying this. But he stayed with the program. And by the end of the day, he had convinced them that every day at work, you and I are surrounded by the creative energies of the people that work for us, and the high-impact manager knows how to harness it. You know who in your company, who in your organization, who down the hall, who upstairs can best do this and best do that. So your job is to orchestrate it. A high-impact manager is much like a conductor. You and I, important point, we create the environment for excellence. If you're in any kind of leadership or management role, you kind of want to lay this off on everybody else, uh-uh. You and I have to create it where people feel comfortable, where people feel that they can bring a new idea to you, where it's safe to fail and try again. Another point, people respond to your presence. If you don't believe me, don't you usually check, don't you always know when your boss is having a bad day? And don't you usually check the lay of the land if suddenly at the last minute you want a couple days off? Every morning when you walk into work, you're conveying, you're, you're giving away vibes, you're conveying an atmosphere of are you approachable or are you not? And I would suggest to you that we are all amazingly transparent. Think of the amount of hours every week we spend with our coworkers, more than families sometimes. So you can't just breeze in and breeze out because for eight, 10 hours a day, people are reacting to you and what you brought to the table that day. Okay, uh, the other thing to be a high impact manager is you've got to embrace change. There's no expression that nobody likes change except a wet baby. Well, okay. If you're a leader or a manager, you better not only like it, you better embrace it. Everybody wants to grow. And like this fish, it looks like he's going into a better place. And I don't mean the great beyond. But he's going into a place with, it just looks a little nicer over there with the plants and this and other. And my point of this stupid slide is that most people do not get up every day determined to make your life hell by introducing change into the organization. Most people are well-intended and they're just trying to improve a process, improve an outcome, make things better. Now, guess what? Inherently, we like change. We like to get new cars. We like to get new clothes. We like to check out new restaurants. We like to Go on vacation, go someplace new, go someplace different. So by and large, as long as we think something's going to be kind of cool and be better, we love it. And the question is, why do we resist it so at work? And I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but maybe part of it is that people don't mind change. They just don't like to be changed. So, Rotarians... What do you do about that? You make sure that if you're in charge of change, if you're implementing change, that you reach out to the people most affected. Involve them, engage them, ask them. I'm firmly convinced that the best way to improve a process is to ask the people who do it what they would do. That's what drives me nuts about consultants. Since some of you in the room are consultants, I apologize. But people too many times have all the answers and none of the questions. If you're gonna have impact in an organization, you've got to ask the right questions. All right, number four, creating a learning environment for yourself. It's employable, employability, security, let's go back one. No, oh, come on. Okay, well I need to stay on this slide. Um, really what we're saying is You've got to execute strategically and not emotionally where change is coming. Because strategic thinking gets you out of a hole. 
and prepares you for the future and lays opportunities for you to grow. If you are perceived as someone who embraces change, will do anything possible to make it happen, will embrace it and engage others, somebody upstairs is going to notice. Trust me. But if you're one of the ones who operates emotionally, like most people, you are going to miss out on a chance to get ahead. Okay, so let's move on to number four, your ability to create a learning environment for yourself. Got to do it. One of my favorite folks there, again, is Peter Drucker. You know, if you had a management or leadership course in college, even as far back if you were in school in 1922, Peter Drucker was writing. And his most important book, arguably, is The Effective Executive. And what he said in there is that self-development of the executive is central to the development of the whole organization. In other words, if you are seen as raising your sights, if you are viewed by other people as someone who never stops learning, then you are going to attract the same kind of people to your organization. Some may call it career resilience. I like to call keeping yourself marketable. And you don't want to become roadkill on the superhighway of change. So you got to figure out what you don't know. And then you got to go find, and it's impossible to not get things answered with YouTube and the internet and everything out there. Microlearning, there are a thousand ways to get better and to accumulate human capital. Because in today's world, you are signing a contract that says, it is not up to my company, it is not up to my employer to provide me with all the personal growth and development that I need. I've got to have some skin in the game. That's why our NMA chapters around the country are so successful. Because I'm seeing budget axes falling in training departments. Some companies have even gotten rid of their training department. Why, I don't know, and that's a whole speech for a whole nother time. But so we're kind of lucky to be in the right place at the right time, and people can join together voluntarily and say, hey, I'm going to step up. I want to be part of this leadership development organization in my company or in my community, and I will take ownership of some of my own growth and development. So, okay, going on to number five your level of emotional intelligence. Well, guess what? It shouldn't be any surprise to any of you. This is what we've been talking about for the previous four. It's really about an awareness of how we carry ourselves. And it's awareness of what's going on with other people. Time Magazine said, emotional intelligence, I love this, may be the best predictor of success in life, redefining what it means to be smart. It used to be IQ. Today, it's EQ. So, I don't know if you have it or not. I hope you do. Um, means you can apply the senses of yours to facilitate anything that's going on. And let me share a story. We used to have, and notice I did past tense, we used to have a young man in our organization who was, before the term millennial became, became one, he was one, which was neither here nor there, because he was just a problem child. And I remember he said to me one day, he goes, why do you go in the break room? I went, um, to get coffee. And he goes, no, no, you know, you always sit down and chit chat. And he goes, I don't want to know that stuff, people. Well, that was when I knew he wasn't long for our world. Because I don't want to know the intimate details of people with whom I work, their personal lives. But I want to know whose kid spent Friday night in the clink. I want to know whose significant other got a really scary diagnosis and they're going for a second opinion in a couple of weeks. I want to know whose mother-in-law from hell just moved in. The reason for that is we expect everybody to be present every day. But back to being a baggage, count, a baggage handler, that doesn't happen. People have things going on in their lives. It is not my job to babysit them. And it's not your job, but it is our job to be respectful of things that are on their mind, the things that are sidetracking them. And trust me, you let an employee, you let a colleague, you let a buddy at work know that you're there for them and you'll cover for them and you'll help out and they can have a little time to take mom to the doctor and this, that, and the other. You get that back tenfold. 
Trust me. So EI is a mindset. It's controlling your impulses. You know, remember I said I usually don't pop off? You can't. You can't do that. You've got to hold yourself back. You've got to know what motivates you. You've got to have this sense of empathy and cer so, hello, certainly social competence. In other words, that you are a pleasure to be around and that you can go into a social situation after work and not talk about work. Because people want to know who you are. That's how you have impact. OK, uh, now we all know this one. What's the number one reason people quit their jobs? Any reason I even put this slide on here is because why do we know this? And why do we know that, uh, let's go down to the yellow part, in the State of the American Workplace Study, Gallup found 50% of employees leave their jobs to get away from their manager. Now, this is not rocket science, and this is not the first time any of you have seen it, but most of us are very guilty of going, well, no one, that, that's not me. That's not I. Might be. <coughs> Could be. I would suggest to you that most people leave an organization because their boss doesn't have any emotional intelligence. <coughs> okay, moving on. Slide, please. Mm -hmm. Back one, Steve. <clears throat> Jim Clifton, who is CEO of Gallup, he said, the biggest single decision you will make, bigger than all the rest, is who you name manager. He should have said whom, but that's okay. <clears throat> when you name the wrong person manager, nothing fixes that bad decision. Not compensation, not benefits, nothing. Really what we're talking about in today's parlance is becoming a servant leader. It doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong and confident because you know who you are and other people aren't second guessing you. They know who you are as well. Michael Wyatt wrote a book called <clears throat> The Leader's Heart. And he said it's the most important leadership tool you have. But you don't have to take my word for it and you don't have to take his word for it. If you haven't been in a bookstore lately, there's 5,000 books on leading with emotional intelligence, leading from the heart. One little sidebar, Tracy, I did this for you. Uh, I was just, I'm like, what do I call this? I'm like, well, Tracy Tanchman will call it a sidebar, so it is. Um, the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro, North Carolina, is one of the best think tanks there is for leadership development. And I saw a study about six, seven months ago that they did on executive derailment, trying to figure out why people in the executive suite of companies get derailed. And I love this. He said it's primarily deficits in emotional competence. They have difficulty handling change. They really don't work well in a teaming environment, which blew me away that that was in there. And no surprise, poor interpersonal relations. So no matter where you are in the food chain, it's important even when you get upstairs. And what I want to close is with, uh, speaking of food chains, one of the people with whom I've had the pleasure of working over the years is a fellow who just stepped down as president and CEO and chairman of the board of Lockheed Martin. His name is Bob Stevens, and we first gave him an award, actually, first year he was there. Okay, so he is known in business circles for something called full spectrum leadership. And the reason I bring that up is most people, it's the flash in the pan, the panacea, uh, what's important this year, what's important this month. Bob Stevens instituted this in 2004, actually unveiled it at one of our conferences. I just didn't know at the time what was coming. And he stuck with it till he retired. He gave a consistent message to his employees. That's a pretty big company. And everybody at Lockheed Martin, because I, I do more business there than anywhere else, everybody at Lockheed Martin knew and understood full-spectrum leadership. So the first part, this slide isn't a surprise. He said it's about delivering rock-solid performance, getting results, meeting objectives, putting the numbers on the board. The other piece is what's important, because a lot of people didn't see it coming. He said the most effective leaders exhibit strong leadership behavior with great interpersonal and communication skills that do the following. CEO, one of the largest defense contractors in the world, now one of the largest IT 
Homeland Security companies, clear mission, you got to put the numbers on the board, but you better clean up your Communication Skills Act and you better develop some interpersonal skills. I couldn't say it better. In summary, we have a leadership model at work. We developed this. I brought together some of the finest minds across business and industry that I could put together at a table and said, come up with a leadership model. I kind of worried because I was afraid that everybody would get stuck in their own company one. Uh-uh. They brought the best pieces of theirs. And it's kind of obvious. Um, uh, a really good leader sets direction. He or she can mobilize individual commitment for change in gender organizational capability, which is a fancy way of saying take care of your employees' needs. But my favorite one, of course, is in the middle. And it's in the middle for a reason. And it touches the other three circles for a reason. It's called demonstrating personal character. And the reason it's in the middle is because if you can't demonstrate personal character, all the other skills don't matter. Nobody's going to follow you. No one's going to listen to you if they don't respect you. They don't know where you're coming from. So it is the most important attribute of a leader. Lastly here, I'm single. I live alone. And that means lots of things. But more, most importantly, it means I have total control of the TV remote. <laughs> and I don't mean to be a sexist pig, so ladies, excuse me. But it's a genetic... It's genetic that men are really good with TV remotes <laughs> and that we can be on Program A, commercial comms, we can check out 42 other stations and programs and be back <laughs> to the first program just when the last commercial is over. It's a gift, and I'm proud of it. So one night I was sitting at home, and oops, time for a commercial. I'm gone, so I'm out of there. And I'm sitting at my desk, luckily, up, upstairs in a bedroom, and because there was paper and pencil there. And somebody it was one of the sports stations, and they were interviewing a former Dallas Cowboy uh, member, <laughs> team player. And they were talking about Roger Staubach. And I wish I had written down who was being interviewed. I didn't. didn't happen. But I did write down what he said. And someone said, well, what was it like playing football with Roger Staubach? And the gentleman didn't miss a beat. He goes, as long as Roger was on the field, I always thought we'd win. I think that, that is better than any gold watch, any big retirement party. For you and me to know that we have that kind of impact in the workplace. As long as she was on the team, I knew we'd come in under budget. As long as he was there, I knew we'd beat the deadline. Now, to me, that's what real impact is about. So we can't control the wind, as everybody knows, but we can control the set of our sails. So I hope all of you will leave here today and go home and go, I can have impact. It really can happen. So Wally asked me to take a second and see if there are any questions that anyone has. Um, probably not, because I already told you everything I know. I couldn't answer a question if I had to. So, all right, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Very enlightening. Um, as a thank you for being here today, a donation will be made in your name to the Polio Plus Foundation. And, and I want to let you know that you are the first and only speaker that has ever chased our executive director out of the room. So. <laughs> It's a skill. It's a skill. It's a gift. Next week, we've got John Gorski from the North American Science Association. There's two meetings today. It's a cabaret. We'll meet in the North Cape Room. Vocational Services will meet in the Presque Isle Room. Chuck and his wife, I hope, are out enjoying the sunshine. They're not with us today. And so I end this meeting asking you to please go out and make a difference in somebody's life today. See you next week. <laughs> Great speaker.